Today we are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from three extraordinary women leaders and citizen journalists from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria, and India who have traveled halfway around the world to be with us today. They will be speaking about the realities of life in their homelands, their experiences, and their visions for using the power of digital media to create change. But first I will introduce Yensina Larson, founder and CEO of Portland-based World Pulse, who will introduce the World Pulse correspondence. Yensina is an unstoppable social media entrepreneur and international journalist who started World Pulse at the age of 28 inspired to broadcast the unheard visions and solutions of women around the world. Today, 50,000 women from 190 countries are connecting and speaking out and changing lives through World Pulse's global media network. World Pulse believes that if women are heard and connected, they will transform the world. Yensina is truly on the pulse of women's perspectives globally and is a frequent national and international speaker, from TED to the inner corridors of the White House. New York Times columnist and author of Half the Sky, Nicholas Kristof, says joining World Pulse is one of the top four things you can do in 10 minutes to empower women worldwide. And without further ado, please help me welcome Yensina Larson. Come join us. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone here today uh, in this powerful celebration of women's voices. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce our three extraordinary women journalists who are here with us. Go ahead and take a seat, get cozy. Those are probably the most comfortable chairs we've had in the last week. <laughs> you know, Portland is actually often thought about as a, a big leader in sustainability. But the truth is, is that it will be impossible for us to have global sustainability without the equal leadership of women and girls. Here today, we're going to look at sustainability from a new lens. And I'm going to talk about, with these three extraordinary women and with all of you, how we can possibly harness the power of new media and digital technology to truly accelerate the pace of women's empowerment around the world. Because the truth is, it's not happening fast enough. If we look at women's leadership globally, women are in leadership positions only 17%. Women are doing two-thirds of the world's work, and they only own 1% of the world's assets. I believe with every single cell of my body that digital media and technology is one of the fastest ways that we can speed up that pulse. Today, we are going to hear from the experts on this topic. And they have come from a big media and speaking tour across the country, just arriving from New York City at the Clinton Global Initiative, at the United Nations, rubbing shoulders with Nobel Peace laureates to bring you their message today. So I would like to introduce to you Nema Namadamu from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hummingbird from Syria. And Stella Paul from India. We are going to hear from them in just a moment. And each woman has carefully been crafting and thinking about the message that she wants to bring to you today, and particularly sharing how she and her community is using digital media 
to power change. But before we go there, I'd like to just share a little bit about World Pulse. Uh, World Pulse, we, this is our birthplace here in Portland. We were founded, I would say, in women's living rooms who supported this initial vision. Uh, I started at a young age, at age 28. I had been very shy all my life. I grew up in rural Wisconsin, and I definitely had a sense that my voice didn't matter. And I know so deeply what it feels like to be invisible. But I took off to be a freelance journalist in the Amazon and worked with indigenous communities and then also on the Burma-Thai border. And I worked with incredible women leaders there who were facing ethnic cleansing, who were facing um, mass rape. And those women in I asked me to be their messenger. And I realized that I didn't want to simply be a messenger, but I wanted to create a media source where these women could be their own messengers for the world. So thus began World Pulse here in Portland. Today we are a global media network that is powered by 50,000 women from 190 countries. Many of them are using internet cafes and cell phones to speak out and to connect. But we also have a thriving community of citizens here in Portland who are also connecting through our global network as mentors, as listeners, connecting and creating change here locally. Over the last few years, as we've been listening through our online web platform from women, their, what's on their hearts and minds every single day, every single hour around the world, They've been telling us how we can increase their impact as leaders on the ground. And so we focus on three core areas, community, content, and training. For the community, any woman who has access to the internet can come onto our website and have a, a voice. She can immediately be connecting with women and men halfway around the world who support her, who hear her, and access information and resources that she might never have dreamed possible. And secondly, we have training. The women were asking, coming online for the first time, how can we use social media to get our voices out and our messages to the world? So we began a rigorous a women's citizen journalism training program, six-month online program that equips women with the curriculum and the tools to be stronger voices. And the three women who are with us today have participated in that program. And then lastly, the content. It's literally a mountain of content that we are sitting on, and we've increasingly begun to channel that content to major media forums like CNN, Reuters, the Huffington Post, and also increasingly to influential forums like the United Nations, like the US State Department. And in fact, on our uh, four-city nationwide speaking tour that we are on right now, uh, our next step is Washington, DC, where we'll be going to the State Department, and then after that, Atlanta. What's happening is a chain reaction of change. Each of these three women is going to share a little bit more about what that means for her, but we certainly are seeing an acceleration of women feeling suddenly so confident by being heard and connected that they are suddenly standing up for their land rights. They're running for office. They're starting their own NGOs or their women-owned um, cyber cafes. They're, they're getting major awards, scholarships, funding, and having their stories picked up and suddenly realizing that they are leaders in the world. It's a, a wave of empowerment that I actually didn't even dream possible when I started World Pulse. But let's get to the best part. Let's hear from each woman herself. And so I'd like to first introduce Nema. And uh, Nema comes from a country that is considered to be one of the worst in the world for women. Over six million people have died since 1996. And Nema is organizing women with disabilities and women leaders across her regions, hundreds if not thousands of women. And normally Nema will stand with her crutches quite, quite proudly, but because we have a radio audience, she will sit today. Nema? Thank you so much. My name is Inema Namadamo. I'm from DRC, Congo. And I'm here to talk about my country and my vision. 
My country is a great country, big country, rich country, but everyone who talk about Congo say Congo is national conflict to national, conflict to minerals. But I'm here to say my country is not lost cause. And my country is like my life. When I born, you see how I talk to sit. I have four legs, I have my crutches. When I get polio, in my country, in many countries, Africa, and maybe also in America, when you had disability, many people say it's shame, it's punishment from God. And me, my mama, she say no. She refused. She said, my daughter, she's not lost cause. It's why I'm here to tell you I'm not lost cause and my country is not lost cause. <laughs> and that, when I get eight years old, my mom, she said, you must go to school. In my country, we don't have road, we don't know car, we don't have access to anything like to can help us to have access. And my mom, she care her own back every day, her own back to go to school. If it's rain, if it's sun, every day for three years, my mom, she was big, she was loves me so, so much with big love. Is why I'm here to say with love we can have access to everything. We can change the world with love. And that my mama, she told me, my big baby, everyone born by purpose, with purpose, and have unique vision. And I'm here to talk about this vision I had. And that every day when I go to school, my uncle come after three years and he told my mom, she said, my sister, she's big, she's heavy. You can continue to call her in your back to go every day and back to school. And I went to my uncle. I finished primary school. I finished secondary school. And I was first girl to finish, to have, to finish university. I have two degrees at university because my mom, she say, no, you are not lost cause. And this, my mom, she was telling me, you have, you born by purpose. And I say, I get vision. And everyone, he doesn't have mom to care her and back to go and back to school. I had vision to connect women through technology, through social media, to have education online. And this, I get this vision, I have to have a cyber cafe, internet cafe in my region for women, for all women who doesn't have access to any information, to any opportunity. And that is only 12 machine and every day from three to seven night and women fighting gives me time also. It's my time to writing my story also because I'm connected to world. And that I say, oh my gosh, how I can get big vision to connect all Congo. Because my Congo, my country is hard for Africa, but it's like we have two worlds. America have one world, we have another world, but it's only one planet. And that I say, okay, I have vision and I went to my country, to Kinshasa. I have now license telecommunication license to build how to connect in social media. And they say, if we are connected, we change, we have a dialogue together, and we can get miracle solution. Is why I'm here to talk about that. Together we have miracle solution. Through what? Through technology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neymar. It's incredible that you secured a telecommunications license for your region as a woman with a disability. How did you do that? 
was not easy. Uh, I went to Kinshasa to ask for my region on East Congo because there is very, very, very complicated. Women doesn't have access to education, access to information, access to opportunity. And I went to Kinshasa four times to ask. When I was talking about this vision I had of fruit technology, and the office president told me, you are the first woman to ask this business. And he said, is it possible? I said, yes, it's, it's possible. And I called some enge partner engineering, and he said, yes, it's possible. And that is say, we give you a license for all Congo. And it was a miracle for me, but me, this is beginning for to have miracle solution. Amazing, thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Next, let us hear from Hummingbird. Many of you have been reading about Syria in the news and it's a wholesale uh, massacre, really a slaughter that's happening across that country now. And uh, at a time when her country needs her the most, here is a emerging leader who is beginning to discover the power of her own voice. Thank you. Um, I came here to talk about freedom and dignity and take it, take them home with me to Syria. The freedom and dignity that many people enjoy around the world, but not us. When I was a little girl, I spent much of my time in my small treasured village in the mountains of Syria. I used to walk barefoot between olive trees. I climbed fig trees. At that time, I felt so free. But today, that time seems far away. In the middle, during the 70s, a military coup took over my country. A brutal regime came that denied human rights and reinforced negative social traditions and practices, especially against women, like honor crimes. Um, my grandmother was in a forced marriage and my mother too. I fell into the same experience. One day, I decided that that's enough. I packed my life in a suitcase. I left the house, and after that, I left Syria. Last year, at the beginning of the last year, Syrians decided to rise and regain the rights they were denied from for too long. But nothing prepared us for the level of brutality that we will see. From one to two million people are displaced inside Syria. 250 people and counting, fled the borders to neighboring countries. They say that there are 30,000 people were killed. I think the number is far more than that. Only last August, 6,000 people were killed. Let me tell you about my life and my family's life in the past two years. I always on news, I always online, hoping and praying that I don't um, 
receive a call. Tell me that uh, I lost a loved one and hoping that I don't see a familiar face on YouTube or on the news like once when I saw my uncle after he was killed by a sniper in the street. I came here to break the silence about Syria. I came here to tell you that talk about it, to tell others that you met me, to share, tweet, write, discuss with your friends, families, write to your officials demanding them to take a decisive stand for the tragedies that an atrocity is going every day inside Syria. I invite you all today to break the silence with me. Thank you. Thank you, Hummingbird. And uh, you are outside of Syria now, and you've said it feels like this endless waiting. But your family's still inside, and they're displaced now? Yes, my family. Um, there's a massacre that took place in the area where my family lives in. Security forces were um, moving from house to house, gathering men and boys, women, and shooting them. Um, I was, um, at that day, the news were coming and all the communications were cut. I couldn't know what is going on there. Um, for some unknown reason, they, when they reached my family's house, they stopped and went to another area. My family is displaced since that time. And um, we are communicating now, but still it's not safe. Nowhere is safe there. Um, I try to... Um, Someone, um, social media and media was very helpful in communicating with my family with what's going on inside because no media is allowed, no free media is allowed there. Um, I wrote about it on World Pulse and someone from World Pulse um, taught me how to start a campaign. Um, I wrote a petition that everyone, anyone can sign that petition and Im uh, immediately an email goes to the Russian and Chinese um, ambassadors to the United Nations telling them to stop weapon shipments to the people in control inside Syria. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Stella, and uh, Stella is an incredible woman leader across India, training other women uh, to tell their own stories in the second largest, most populous country in the world. Namaste, one more time to everyone. My name is Stella, and I come from the northeast region of India. It's a region that borders China, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Bhutan. I'm extremely excited and privileged to be here today. Among you, in your city, to me, this is a city of a lot of greenery, fresh air, 
Voodoo Donut, <laughs> the very interesting streetcar, and above all, people who are just so full of love and affection and understanding. So thank you for letting me be here. There is actually one more reason why I'm excited and privileged to be here. And that's because I should not have been even alive today to meet you all. When I was a small child, an infant, me and my brother were sick with diphtheria, and my brother died. And then my relative said that I should be just left alone to die because I was a girl child and I wasn't worth saving. But my mom, who refused to accept that, picked me up in her arms, ran out of our house, found one doctor who performed a surgery that saved my life. And so I lived. And I lived with a scar on my throat that every day reminds me how lucky I am just to have survived. Many, many, many girl children in my country just don't. In fact, every single day, 1,600 girl children in India, the largest democracy in the world, are killed in their mother's wombs just because they are girls. So I am extremely privileged and extremely lucky to have lived and to have grown up as an unwanted girl child because it's this being unwanted also made me understand the need and the difficulties of girls and women in my country. And today, I'm an environmental journalist. I write stories about climate change, sustainable development, drought, water crisis, coastal pollution. And I tell those stories through the eyes of women. Women who are from the marginalized and vulnerable communities and how they are affected by these problems and how they're fighting it. And it does work. I have got a few awards, and one of them came as I was traveling to the US. The United Nations Population Fund has just given me an award for best gender sensitive reporting. Thank you. But besides journalism, I do something else. I train the very women that I report upon who are from the vulnerable communities into basing internet, into cell phone journalism, into video journalism, and more. And I tell them, I train them into how to use them at a time when they are at the lowest phase of their lives how they can use it to empower themselves. And it does work. And here is an example. Two months ago, a woman, a young woman whom I had trained how to use internet through her cell phone was trafficked and sold in a brothel. And she sent a text message using a cell phone through a web-based service to a group of people that included a few NGOs, and she was rescued by them. Thank you. And 
I, I, I was telling somebody today in the, uh, in the Washington DC where I'm going to speak on Monday that I'm sitting on a mountain of impact, stories of impact that are coming on ground, that are unfolding. They were a little apprehensive. Is it, does it really work? And I told them, I'm going to tell you that it does work. And that's what keeps me going. And this is why I feel I am a chain builder. I build chains of women who are empowered, who have the courage to overcome the situation that life has put them on. And I do that. I bring them together. I give them the access to technology because I believe in the tremendous power to bring change in the society that exists in every single ordinary woman, like my mom. Thank you. So here is how my vision and you people come together. First, my vision. I visualize a world where I am building chain and I'm bringing in millions and millions of women together. I can't train all of those millions of women, but I'm going to train 10,000 of them, and they are going on to train another 10,000. Those are going to train another 10,000. That's how I'm going to build that chain. And how does that connect to you? I think each one of you can be a chain builder too. First, you can be a chain builder by listening. Just listen to the stories of women doing something to rise above the situation, to do something good, to make this world and their own lives a better place. And when you do that, you go and share it with another 10 people. And they will go and share with another 10 people. And instantly, you are going to be a link in a huge chain of inspiration. Second, I visualize, I see a woman as a symbol, a symbolic tree. And the, wo the women of the world are like a huge forest. Now, if you want to see a tree grow higher and taller in its full glory, spraying on the leaves is not a solution. The best way to do that is to water its roots. So it expands its roots into the soil, and it absorbs the power from therein, and it grows. So let's support organizations and programs that try to bring women together, give them the access to technology, technology that can transform their lives, technology that can help them bring out the power in their own personality and fight this entire chain of difficulties that they are surrounded by. And when you do that, you are again going to create a chain, chain of empowered women chain of women who are change makers, not victims. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I would love to ask you a few questions first before we open it up to the audience. So uh, for all of you out there, do be thinking about the questions that you have for each one, whether it's uh, one woman individually or for all three. But each of you are talking about technology as a tool of, of liberation in your countries. But how difficult is it really for women to access the technology? And is it more difficult for women than men in your countries? Yes. Nema? Yeah. <laughs> um, I love to be here in this city. And in my vision, I want Congo, New Congo to be like Portland. 
I have a family in Portland. My grand sister, she's there. I was say, she's welcome here. Now, where is the barrier? Barrier is first culture. Culture for our country doesn't give women have access where is things, no place for women to make decision. This is the number one. And number two, education. It's like maybe two percentage for women who have access to education, no access to education. And number three, economics things. For example, to have access to internet, to phone, you must have money. And in our culture, the men have, for example, access to television in the house, radio. Everything who, give, who gives you to have access to something, he can tell you, change. Women doesn't have access. So the men are controlling often these communications. Of whether course, of radio, course. TV. Men is our boss. We love them, but he's try to control everything. He doesn't let us to have access to information and to opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what you're changing with your cyber cafe. Yes. Yes, exactly. My and cyber cafe only women. <laughs> Um, anyone else? Stella Hummingbird, would you like to? Yes. Um, in addition to what Nema said, um, there is the cultural and economic barriers. Um, there is also, um, well, before the uprising, there was um, a lot of uh, harassment in internet cafes. So a woman cannot go there and um, use a computer. Um, I wasn't able to go there if it was crowded and um, sometimes um, I pass by someone watching an offensive uh, something. But um, after, after the uprise, there's, there, there's also um, uh, the use of social media boomed in, in the Arab Springs. So, um, but it's also the men who are using it more than women. Um, probably because the cultural barriers also extended to after the uprising. And there is also the um, intended um, um, women are uh, the, the, the target targeted because they are, the, they are considered in our community the symbol of honor, the symbol of um, chastity, um, and they um, will humiliate the, the rebels or the other, um, uh, or the society if they attack women. They will break them. This is another um, reason for that. Thank you. Uh, Hummingbird, actually, I don't think you had a chance to share your vision with the audience. Would you mind just briefly sharing your vision? Yes. Um, my vision is that um, after the, this madness will, will end, um, I would be able, actually, I'm, I'm thinking of, of it right now. I don't want to start it before the madness end. I want to do it inside the madness. I want to use, uh, want be able to use social media for reconciliation and the healing process between Syrians in my country. I would like to bring them, use the technology to bring them together to talk about their fears and what they want, their expectations. Um, and we would probably just erase this grudge raise this anger among them. Thank you. Thank you. Stella, just, maybe just a brief response to this one and I'll, I'll ask one more question. Yeah, there are actually specifically three type of barriers that women in my country face, the larger section of women in accessing technology. The first one is of course, like my other sisters said, um, it's cultural. Uh, women in general are not expected to move around on their own. And so 
if they have to go out or go access technology to, to use internet in a cafe, they are expected to be escorted by a man, uh, which is always not possible. Uh, the second one is the way internet cafes work, the work hours that don't suit the schedule of a woman. She's busy in the morning and evening, and uh, in fact, most of the time, she's, she's not free, uh, allowed to, to leave the house after dark. And uh, she's o she only has a few hours uh, during the day, midday, and that's when the internet cafe is shut down for lunch. So that's a big barrier. Um, uh, sh then uh, there is a rampant molestation or teasing, what we call is, is actually sexual harassment at the cafes. Uh, if a woman goes on his own, her own. So those are the cultural ones. Uh, we have technical barrier. Uh, most of the uh, women that I work with, I meet, uh, don't uh, know how to speak or read or write uh, English. And the keyboards are in English, and therefore they just don't understand how to use it. So that's the technical one. And the third one is a unique communication gap. Uh, and by that I mean is that the demand, uh, the supply quite does not meet the demand. And by demand, I don't mean the volume of demand. I mean the character of the demand. Technology is as, I mean, technology has a different uses. Every user has a different way to use technology. Everyone has a different need. What you might need may not be my need. So a lot of women who live in vulnerable communities are not educated. And uh, the, their need is not a, a big computer with a big screen or monitor, but something that can actually just help them in a very, very simplified way to reach out to a lot of people. That is their core need. Now, my government is doing a lot it is setting up infrastructure, it is setting up community, computer rooms, but is that what the women in the community need? Most of the time, no. They actually need cell phones sometimes, something that won't be grabbed by their husbands or by men, or if there is a police raid or army raid, because we have a lot of conflict going on, they can just hide it inside their blouse so they won't be confiscated. That's the kind of need they have and it's not being matched by the, with the supply. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stella. So now we're gonna take some um, questions from, from the membership. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting discussion. We now wanna invite members to uh, participate in the discussion with you. If you have a written question on an index card, please hold it up high now so that the City Club staff can collect it from you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from today's Friday Forum host, Bill Holmer. Bill is the president of the first Princeton Corporation and an honors graduate with a degree in economics from Princeton University. Bill joined City Club in 1999 and currently serves on the Finance Committee as the club's treasurer. Bill? Uh, thank you, Pat, and thank all of you for coming today, uh, making this one of our great Friday forums, and thanks to each of you for your very moving and sensitive stories about uh, your experiences and, uh, and how World Pulse is helping you achieve your visions. My question for you is for you, Hummingbird, specifically. Um, we've watched uh, what has been transpiring in Syria and I would like to give you this opportunity to share with us w what changes you would like to see, if any, in U.S. foreign policy towards Syria. Thank you for the question. I would like, I would like to see the United Sta uh, States take firm stand toward what is going on in Syria because we don't feel or, or, or we see that the, the, the foreign policy of United States is unclear. We don't know what they think. We don't know um, what they want us to do. 
and it's um, 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 we really would like uh, the foreign policy to talk firmer, to act in more decisive way, that this is what's need to be. We don't want military intervention. This is to, um, we are not asking for that because this, okay, the, 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 the soldiers who are killing the people are also Syrians and we don't want to ruin our military. We need humanitarian aid because seriously, there is um, very few aid we can get especially in refugees camps. The refugee camp in Jordan is a disaster and I don't know why the um, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is silent. And we would like also um, probably no-fly zones, not like the, the, the no-fly zones in Libya where they hit the, the, the armies, no. We want the, 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 to, a safe areas where people can go there, refugees can go there. The, the, the soldiers who don't want to shoot their people can go there, resort to this area. Thank you. We will now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their questions. Asking questions at the Friday Forum. Microphone is a privilege of City Club membership. Please ask your questions in 30 seconds or less if I flash this question mark. Uh, it's an indication that it's time to wrap up your questions. Also, I will try to read at least one of the questions from the index cards. Wynne Wakala, City Club member and also Executive Director for FAST, which stands for Fight Against Slavery Trafficking and fight against sex trafficking. Here in the US, the internet, you know, is also a very good thing, but it turns out over 50% of internet use is for pornography, which has really catapulted the sex trafficking. And now that you're getting technology in your countries, has that made it worse for sex trafficking and what are you doing about it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the first part of your question is, has pornography catapulted or aggravated the situation? I don't think so. Sex work, we are calling it sex work now. It used to be called prostitution, has been the oldest profession in this world. And um, uh, it existed in societies that did not have pornography. So, from my experience, uh, yeah, there is, of course, a relation between the demand and, and the supply, you know, because the demand goes higher. But there are a lot of reasons that the women that I work with, they are into sex work, not because of, uh, and then the clients that they are, they are all local clients. So it's really, and, and the clients also do not have access to technology. So, uh, I mean, they're not watching porn, actually, or, or uh, accessing internet. So these women, there are several reasons. It's, it's a pure link between loss of their traditional livelihood and the despair to find an alternative livelihood, which they don't get. And then the only way left for them is to go into sex work, because that's the only profession where you don't have to be educated. Yeah. And, and uh, the, most of the women, they are displaced. They, are, they have migrated from their villages because of either climatic conditions or for a conflict. And they come into the city where they do not have any contact. The only two jobs left for them, job options, is one to work as domestic help, for which they do not have to, that they can't get a good reference from someone. And the other one is that they are not educated, so they go straight into sex work. So that's a very, very emerging scenario in India right now. The other one, what am I doing about it? Like I said, these, I, I, I mean, there are very, very few journalists who would tell you that, who, that 
interviewing sex worker for a story for Reuters or the UN, uh, uh, they can't even think the think of the link. They would go straight to the high up officials high up there or the NGO heads. So while I also talk to the government officials, instead of talking to the NGO head, I actually go down right in the community that the NGO works with. And I get, I treat these women as subject matter experts because they are the ones who have lived the difficulty, lived the problem. So instead of getting it from a third person uh, representative, I get it straight from the people there. And that's, the, that's my way of contributing to, to, to making them visible to, and, and, and I, I am a connector, so I connect those people to the people who can change and help them, like the government officials. That's what I do, besides, of course, training them. And one very specific example I would like to give them is that I have just started to work with uh, adolescent girl children of the sex workers who are extremely vulnerable, so much so that their mothers actually lock them inside the house when they go out for work because they're scared that in their absence some, some brokers or some pimps will come and take them away and just traffic them or sell them, force them into prostitution. They do not want that. They want a new generation to grow up as normal people like you and me and access the civic rights that you and I have. And, but at the same time, locking them inside is not, is not going to help. So I, I, am, I, I actually have started teaching them how to use the internet. So if there is a crisis situation, somebody's trying to grab them, they can just send an, uh, a, a, a phone, make a phone call or they can just send a text message and they can, be, they can access help. So whatever I can, I believe that nobody should, can, can not do nothing. Everyone can do something. That's the power I believe in. Thank you. Carol. Carol Wetherill, City Club member. First of all, thank you so much for your stories of vision, courage, purpose, um, and bringing the world together through social media. I also heard you talk about uh, reconciliation and healing efforts. And my question is, um, it seems to me from my reading and use of social media that the countries which have used reconciliation and healing efforts post-trauma and conflict have done much better at creating stable governments and civil societies. It seems to me no coincidence that women are typically leading these efforts. So my big question is would the world be a more stable and civil community, society, global society, were there at least 50% women in every legislature, as there is now in Rwanda, I understand? I believe yes. Um, in, um, in history, um, the, um, the, the few uh, phases in history when women were um, in power, there was um, more um, development, there was more progress and less wars. I believe women act um, um, in the sense of their motherhood, that all creatures, that all humans, well, most of them are their children and they must be taken care of. So yes, um, the women in my country, they also, uh, they, their, their um, tone um, in, in dealing with the issues going on in Syria is more peaceful, more um, loving, and more uh, wanting this reconciliation. And they also send, um, while the men um, gave up on sending calls to the soldiers who are killing people, that we are our, your, your, your people, your brothers, your sisters, women did not give up on that. So, yes. Let me ask this question from our audience to all three women. What has World Pulse meant to you, and how has World Pulse helped you find your voice? I would love to go first. <laughs> I'm the selfish one when it comes to that question. <laughs> um, a while ago, 
I just showed you this scar that I have on my throat. And for 28, 29 years of my life, I let that scar define my life, rule my life, but in a very destructive way. As I was growing up, I was told about the story only when I was 15 year old. I was told, I, I didn't discover that my mom was a hero until I was 15 year old, because that's how the society treats women. Uh, they deny their right to be an achiever by not telling the story. So I didn't know why was I having this scar, and I used to feel extremely ashamed to have this ugly scar here. And uh, I, I, every time I tried uh, meeting people, tried to make friends, date a guy, he would immediately just see this thing and not the rest of me and say, what is that thing on your throat? And I would immediately go back into a shell. And sometimes I would try to find a scarf to, to hide that scar or find a piece of jewelry like a choker. And I would love winter just because I could wear a pullover or, or a scarf, so my scar wouldn't show. And then last year, uh, uh, in 2011, I, that's when a, a journalist friend of mine told me about World Pulse, that there is a platform where women, women can talk uh, among themselves. And I came and I, uh, I, I began by just posting a small story about my uh, experience as an uh, survivor of infanticide. And I, I, I showed that I live uh, with this car and I immediately got 10 responses from women living in countries like Siberia, Madagascar, Mali, Uganda, Solomon Islands. I don't even know exactly. I have to scratch my head to think which part of the world is Solomon Islands in, you know? And, and, and those are women who were reading my story and, and saying, oh, you know what? I have something terrible happened that happened to me as well and I haven't talked about it and immediately it, it did magic to me so me who was disowning her body for all these years just could reconcile with the fact that this is who I am I'm I, I, there's nothing to be ashamed about but I have something to be extremely proud about I'm a proud daughter of a mother who had the courage to challenge the societal norms and bring change and save me. So that's how I found myself with World Pulse. Thank you. Thank you. For your questions, I found World Pulse, he gives me again life. No one who can speak for, I speak for myself. And it's that I'm free. And I'm not a journalist, but I'm voice for also other women who can't speak, who can't come here. But World Pulse I, is like my vehicle. I use that to reach all world. And is that I say World Pulse is big to me because he connected me and myself. I talk. I, no one who can speak for me. I speak myself. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I found uh, I found War Pulse after I was uh, shocked by a Syrian uh, website for defending women's rights. And after the uprising started, this website, or the manager of the website, started to support the rights of the women who are with the regime and not the women who are against the regime. And I was so angry, so I started to search online. I found World Pulse, and I was um, grateful because the women are talking with their own voice. They are the ones who are uh, uh, weaving their experiences uh, online and telling us what is going on with them. While um, I, I, I lost more faith in the, uh, the people who write about others because um, sometimes they put into their own perspectives and their own twists in their stories. And this is why I, um, 
I clinged into world pulse. Also writing about my, my, my story and my country reinforced the confidence in me because there are also, uh, I received the support and I shared the experience with many women around the world who shared the same, who went through the same. So we make this um, undefend uh, um, strong force that we can defeat the odds in, in our lives. So, thank you. We have, run, we have run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join us next week for the mayoral debate between Charlie Hales and Jefferson Smith, moderated by Tracy Berry, KGW news anchor. And as we close today, please join me in offering a sincere thanks to today's speakers, Yancina Larson, Hummingbird, Nema Namadabu, and Stella Paul. Thank you very much.